I am Americana to the core. My name is Bianca Guimarães. Hello, my name is Francisco J. Nunez. My name is Yadira de la Riva. Hello, my name is Bonafide Rojas. My name is Rosemary Pereira, and this is my pet feed. When I was um, a little kid, I always wanted to, to be an astronaut, but that didn't work out. So I, so I started um, thinking about the things that I didn't want to do before I started thinking about the things that I, that I wanted to do. And I knew that I didn't want to be a doctor and I didn't want to be a physicist. I didn't want to be a lawyer. Um, so advertising sounded good, but I didn't know what I was really getting into. Um, and that's when I decided to actually um, go to, to advertising school. And I, I started um, school and then I, I started interning when I was 19 in my first advertising agency as an art director. And, and that, was, that was pretty much how I started without really knowing what I was getting myself into. My mom started me off when I was five years old because she was very timid growing up and she didn't want that for me. So she put me in dance classes, and, but she never ever thought that uh, I would grow such a love for it. And it was instantly from the first day. And since that day, I knew that this is what I was gonna do for the rest of my life. I became interested in theater since I was in elementary. I had, uh, in my second grade class, Ms. Torres, she had us do about three plays in one year, and that's how she used to teach us language arts and history. And um, we did a Thanksgiving play, we did a Christmas play, and then we did like a fairy tale. And I enjoyed it so much, and I guess she liked how I did so much that she invited me to come third grade to do it again. A friend of mine wrote this monologue about just the struggles that we face as, uh, as children of immigrants, second, third generation Latinos, and just young high school students who want to have better lives for ourselves. And uh, the minute he got off stage, I was a, l a bit shocked with the, the, the outpour of support that he got from everybody, the way the girls looked at him afterwards. I mean, I'm gonna be serious. And uh, on the way back down from Albany, I, I wrote my first poem. I showed uh, my friend who, who wrote the monologue, showed him this poem. And the, the weird part about this, and I've, I've probably replayed this in my head about 10 times, is that there are two things that can happen in this. One, he can support me, and two, he, he doesn't. Where support sometimes is a very, some, sometimes a thin line that you find it or you don't. But he wasn't, he was really supportive. And uh, to this day, um, you know, even though I rarely ever see him, he lives out in Phoenix, he still gets mentioned in that conversation of how did I start writing? Because he went out his way and supported me. We talked about writing for a good, but good year. I was 17, he was 16. And that first summer, I read about 65 books of poetry. And I think that is uh, probably the most poignant lesson out of all that, that here's this 17 year old Puerto Rican kid from the Bronx who already dropped out of high school, didn't really go to high school, just really hung out in New York, was a graffiti writer, and all of a sudden here's poetry, the written word, and it completely changes my life. What I noticed, even though I was going to school to learn English and math and science, it made me different being able to play the piano, especially in the neighborhood I grew up. I grew up basically in Spanish Harlem. And in the Dominican Republic, we grew up in a not very wealthy neighborhood. So no one had a piano. In fact, down there, you can't really have a piano because it's so humid. If you have no air conditioning, the wood just deteriorates. But we still had one. She actually went out of her way to buy one down there. And when I played the piano down there, people listened because the doors are all open and the windows are all open. Here as well in New York City. So people knew me as a pianist in my neighborhood. I was always practicing. All the kids were downstairs playing stoop ball. And I would look out the window, wishing I was playing stoop ball as well, but I had to practice. And that piano opened up doors for me. When it comes to influences, by being from Brazil, I think of my family, like where Brazilians are very like family-centric. And I feel that um, I've, I've been always very close to my family. And so when you ask me about my influences, I feel that my parents are um, the people that are that were um, influenced me the most. You know, I grew up with a lot of uh, cumbias, a lot of um, 
you know, Mexican music, music from the U.S. And all of those have formed how I see the world now, the way I talk, the way I relate to people. My first teacher, Yolanda Fernandez Kinkose, she was, she has been like the role model. She showed me the way. She had a family, she had her studio, she's a teacher, and she kind of showed me that it, it was possible. So she's definitely who has influenced me the most. I had to think of three traits that have helped me succeed this far in life. The very first one was my family. You know, they are hardworking, loving people. Um, it's, it's really someone, my mother specifically, who I look to to help me out. The second trait of the people that I've worked with, my friends, my the incredible energy and smarts. You know, if you surround yourself with dedicated, smart, great people, they won't let you fail. If I had to think the third trait, perseverance. You know, we fail all the time. We, there are so many things in life, where you, you're not gonna always make it, but you can't stop that. You gotta keep going and use whatever you learned from that pain of loss to make yourself better. Sense of humor. Can't really go around taking yourself too seriously because then you end up taking things very personal, which I don't think is healthy, especially in the, in, in the creative community. Uh, drive. The, the biggest thing, the biggest thing for me as, as an artist is, is having longevity and having a, you know, for lack of a better word, a, a very certain sense of, of myth and legend by the time I'm dead. Because that again will also translate over to my son something that he can use not necessarily as a you know like an imaginary trust fund but more like the ability for people to open doors up for him because he is you know my heir or just the next of kin and the third one is is a reinvention that's a the concept of reinvention especially in terms of someone who was born out of you know the hip-hop community when when you embrace hip-hop as a as a reinventive tool, uh, those things become uh, basis for you to just change your life in a very certain manner. Uh, one of them definitely is growing up in a very strong and big family. Um, I feel like everything that I learned from them, that's, that's my foundation, where I learned about respect where I learned about love, where I learned about responsibility, it's all from my family and I feel like those values transcend anywhere. Also, I'm very persistent. If I say I'm going to do something, I'm going to do it. If it takes a year, five years, ten years, however long it takes, I'm going to do it. Because I said I was going to, because that's what I, that's what my intention is. I think the third one is just being creative. I feel like aside from any skill that I could gain or any you know, knowledge that I could acquire, being creative helps me connect with people on other levels, whether it's dance or storytelling or, ah, there's so many different forms of art that I feel like need no language. Definitely perseverance, that's number one. There's so many times that I just wanted to give up because of the recession, because of, you know, things get tough and I just, something never allowed me to quit. I always knew there was a bigger picture at the end and that drove me to where I am today. Discipline. I've had to be very, very disciplined to juggle everything that I need to juggle from my family life to uh, owning the business and to being an educator. Without very strict discipline, I wouldn't have been able to make it. The Latino is a blended figure. We've always been American. We've always been American. You know, that border was constructed in, you know, 1848. But before that, all of that used to be in Mexico. So a lot of the families that used to live there originally continue to live there. A lot of the culture has always been there. So I feel like the, the proximity both to the American dream and to a community that has always been familiar was always there. I am very grateful to allow my perspective 
to be added on to this continuum of everything that came before me. Uh, my generation, the generation before me, and the generation after me, we are nothing but continuations of the first four or five generations before us. And you know, unique is a really, really it's kind of a cautious word because you're thinking you're doing something that never been done before, that, that your life is, is completely different from everyone else's and it's not. But your perspective, that's what needs to be considered unique because that is the only thing in you that is gonna be unique. In terms of cultural perspective, I'm just, I'm just really grateful that people take my perspective and they listen. Making the Latino American experience unique is very challenging to describe. I think that when people think of a Latino, they have an image of one person. Of that, you know, I used to be called Ricky when I was a kid, you know. And, you know, that was, that's who I represented, Ricky Ricardo, you know, to people. That people ask me, hey, where's your, where's your Baba Louie drum? You know, it's pretty fun. And I, I would bring one, I'd play it, and it'd be great. But if you look at all the different kinds of foods, all the different kinds of cultures, all the different kinds of dance, all the rhythms, the different colors of people, the different backgrounds and names, the accents, it's incredible. There is no one Latino. There is everything. It's completely unique. I don't think the U.S. has fully embraced uh, Latino culture because if we were fully embraced as a community and as a culture, then why would there be laws that are um, being passed to ban books that explain our history? Why would there be laws that are working towards um, removing ethnic studies, something that was fought for so much during the civil rights movement. Why would they work towards eliminating something like that? Or raza studies, you know, whether it's in Arizona or even budget cuts that cut those specific programs in California or, or other states. For any country to embrace the richness of its diversity and the richness of everyone that has contributed to it, then you have to keep that. You have to educate people on the origins of why everybody's there. We have always been here. We have always been here to provide, you know, a labor force, um, any kind of support. And that's not just Latinos. I mean, that's people all throughout the world that were brought here because the U.S. needed that resource in order to build itself as a nation. So I feel like until we are able to um, be allowed to embrace our own culture, embrace our own history, embrace um, everything that makes us who we are, our, our religious beliefs, then we will not be harassed in our churches, we will not be harassed in our schools or our homes or, or any place that are important to our survival here in the United States. In my feeling, I think America has embraced Hispanic culture, those that have Hispanics around. It depends where you are in our country. If you're not surrounded by people, then you don't know anything about them. You know, I was talking to someone and, you know, if you, if you, if you think about where you are, if you're constantly surrounded by people that are looking different than you, you get used to the idea and you're not afraid of it. So if you walk into the subway, even though you might not have a friend that's African American or a friend that comes from the Hindi background or a Sikh or a Muslim or, 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 or a person of different um, religious uh, um, background, but by looking at them in the subway, you start to see what it's like to be next to them, you sit next to them, you smell them, you touch them, you know what it's like, you see their hair. You're not, the fear goes down. You might not be their friend, but something in your soul understands it closer. Do I feel like it could be embraced more? Absolutely. But um, TV seems to have embraced it. You always see a, a Latino character come out more in, in TV. You see, you see more of it. I think definitely entertainment is one of them, and especially because in advertising, our industry, we're closer to that. Um, so I do feel that um, it's the, the Hispanic, like the, the culture, the whole thing is so rich that I think that could um, could be um, showing up more a little on that on the entertainment part. And I feel that people sometimes don't get the full the full picture. The, the macho, the, the sex star, the vixen, the, the sexy dancer, the, the, the Spanish guitar player. Those, those images, those stereotypes are probably the ones that America has taken the most on 
because they can repackage it with different ethnicities and pass them off as Latino. It's, it's definitely about having more people behind the camera. You know, behind the camera is probably more important than anything else. And even behind the camera, producers. If the producers are, are Latinos who have a progressive image and want to pump that progressive image, progressive image out to America, then they won't be able to go, hey, we have three Latino actors, you know, they're gonna be gangbangers. If I'm a producer, I'm like, no, why don't we just make them, you know, sell some books. To me, what, what stands out the most is that um, all our girls, all our young girls get pregnant early or that they have a lot of children and I don't think that's the case. I think it's, and that could happen in any culture, but it's being depicted on TV, in movies, that that's the case and that's absolutely wrong. I, am, I teach kids, I teach the teenage years, the adolescent years, and it couldn't be further from the truth. Celebrating is a tool of identification because it, it lets people know that we're here. And that's, I think that's the biggest thing. If people don't know we're here, they're never gonna acknowledge us. Everyone is questioning what is race today. And that is a question that we never should stop asking ourselves. We're a blended America and we're gonna to continue to, to grow through the pain and joy of that blend. It's coming in from the music, it's coming in from the culture, it's coming in from religions. Our youngest people are the ones who are gonna lead the way. So we're not post anything, we're deep in it. But I see it as a blend that's quite lovely. I think that if it's post-racial, then why should anybody's history be reduced to one month out of the whole year? I really feel if we have really transcended um, race, then we will acknowledge everybody's contribution to this country year-round. I definitely come across things in my everyday life where it does make a difference. My skin color, my ethnicity, my, my culture. Uh, so that is why it's, it's, it's especially important that we have a platform, that we have uh, that we have somewhere to showcase all the wonderful things we have to offer, all the educators, all the, the talent that we have within our, within our Hispanic community. I've had incredible mentors in my life. Uh, today, I can point to two or three that really help me and guide me in what I'm doing. And they're my friends. Uh, it's my wife and my best friends, you know. And everything I do is about inclusion. Through many thoughts, many ideas, and the idea of, of back and forth, you know, of throwing ideas out and creating a think tank, so to speak, of my friends, we're able to create new things. There's no way I did everything that I did today alone. These friends, this think tank that I have, that I surround myself with. They are the reason that I'm successful today. Because I get tired, I make mistakes, but they're always there to do for me what I do for young people. You know, they help me. And without them, I don't think I'd be who I am today. My parents were ones that like, that I've always kind of went for approval, and they've always pushed me to, to do new things and to keep um, keep going. And since I started working, I mean, having a lot of people that believed in me and helped me get to where I'm at and also um, are always um, helping me see the, the right way and, and pushing me to, to take the next steps. And I think this is super important because, um, because that's what actually got me to do the things um, that I've done that got me moved to the U.S. without my family and and I appreciate having people that push me to do all those things. I think mentorship is a necessity for, for, for our youth. I think um, everyone should do it. Everyone should take the time to do it. I think I definitely had mentors along the way and I love to mentor. I, I feel like I'm doing it right now with a lot of my, my kids. Sometimes, especially I think during the teenage years, it's very easy to gear off and you need someone to kind of keep you in line and keep you focused and I think with mentors you can do that. I think everyone needs mentors because things that we're doing 
sometimes need an older perspective on what we're doing. I literally had about a dozen people about 10 years older than me when I was coming up that go, look, you have to read more. Like, you have to read more. You have to pick your vocabulary up. You have to stop speaking so fast on stage. They took their time out. And because of that, I knew that I was part of a, another cycle that I had to do the same thing with people younger than me. If I didn't have mentors, I would not be here. I, I really want to recognize, you know, Don Williams and Rosalie Cabrera for, for inspiring me to do theater for myself, for showing me the ropes along college and telling me that I should go to graduate school when I didn't know I even wanted to do that or I didn't know that existed past college. I thought college was my ultimate goal. I didn't know that there was so much more after that that I could explore for myself. So I love them, my peers. I feel like a lot of my mentors now are my peers. I, I love them, I respect them, and they inspire me personally, artistically, every day. And I feel like we are in those positions now to mentor other people. Love your books. When you love your books and you love your art, I'm telling you, it just works wonders. You, you spend weekends reading. Your boys want to go out? Cool. You're going to stay home read the new Juno Diaz book, the new Garcia Marquez book. Now you want to stay home and, and eat all the li literature that you can. And then second, just be patient. You know, this isn't, this isn't fast food. A lot of people want to go into conducting. Conducting is great. To tell a hundred people what to do, you know, it's a lot of fun. <laughs> You know, it's like the CEO of, of, of a company, you know, orchestra conductors have to tell a lot of intelligent people what to do. So young people like that. You know, there's a lot of power in young people today. They really feel powerful because parents, the way they're bringing them up, which is really terrific. What I would like to tell young people is to think a little differently. My name is Bianca Guimarães, and what makes me feel different é que eu sou aberta a novos desafios, a aprender novas línguas, a me introduzir em novas culturas, e foi isso que me trouxe aqui. And that in, in English means uh, my name is Bianca Guimarães, uh, and I'm differenter because of my openness uh, to learning new things, um, new languages, and um, being part of a new culture, and that was uh, what brought me here. Hola, eu sou Francisco Nunes. Lo que me hace un differenter es que yo creo en inclusión donde todos los jóvenes tienen un chance para ser tremendo. Hi, I'm Francisco Nunez, and I'm a different chair because I believe in inclusion, where all young people have an opportunity to be great. Yo soy different chair porque soy fronteriza americana usando arte y poesía para unir a comunidades a nivel nacional e internacional. My name is Bonafide Rojas, y yo soy un diferente porque poesía es mi vida, y mi vida es poesía. Poetry is my life, and my life is poetry. Yo soy differenter porque con mi pasión por baile cambio la vida de todos mis alumnos. My name is Rosemary Pereira. What makes me differenter that I get to enrich the lives of children through my passion for dance.